and coding and programming is in there. It's part of it, AP classes and all of that. So it, I'll have to- I just learned about it today. Really? You just taught me what, about ingenuity today. So I yep. didn't even know that until now. I'm telling you, and it's one of maybe seven really sophisticated online platforms that exist, but it's, I can't even tell you, it's so much better than the one, and there's a reason for that. I, I can totally see because, I mean, the fact that uh, you have, more importantly, um, so many options now available, like you've chosen this one, it obviously is a better than most option. <laughs> so... Of course, until we find something better, right? Right. <laughs> Experience helps. Yeah, yeah. So how many years have you been uh, teaching, actually? Um, eight years. Eight years total. Well, eight years cool. teaching children. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, fair <laughs> enough. Fair enough. Eight years teaching children. Yeah, so, so well, we can, we can argue that some of us are uh, uh, overage children. <laughs> I have someone joining and she doesn't want to be seen one moment. Okay, can you come by? Well, I started, it's live right now. It's live, all right. Oh, you guys can hear me. <laughs> I'm joking. So anyone who's watching, just have your nice laugh. All right, so um, we have people joining in. It is 10.53 and at 11, we start. This is if you want to uh, share it with your friends on www.clearwaterbahais.org. Um, we have a check for video feed on YouTube. If Jeremiah confirms that it's working, this will be the this will be the live feed. Otherwise, we're gonna have to cut it and restart it. That's fine. I'm flexible. So. Um, I have a question. Um, when it comes down to like your experience and then Corona comes in, mm -hmm. uh, has it really changed how you teach? Not at all. Because of the online system, Ingenuity, um, okay. we were able to very quickly disperse when the schools closed. Uh, we dispersed to homes and just did it from there. And that's when we created the servers to communicate. So, um, so you already had built in resilience to something that would have been like coronavirus pandemic yes right yeah it was very i i feel terrible saying that because I, there's so many systems that really suffered but we did i had 100 percent re-enrollment after that because really we, no because that, that's, that's great i mean that tells you something so <laughs> yeah and, yeah and more importantly it says hey guys out there we're having problems take note there's a way to do it, yeah. And that was never even in the cards. I mean, we just knew we needed something automated and transparent. Yeah. You know, so, but it just, yeah, it was a real blessing. Then we, when we went back to the school building because we're a micro school, it was very easy to set up separate spaces for the students. And we just continued with the online coursework. We didn't even wait to start the school year. We didn't need so to. For people watching the the before, uh, before session, <laughs> So uh, behind the scenes, if you will. So can you explain again, because it wasn't running when you explained it to me before, uh, what Ingenuity is? Sure, so Ingenuity is um, an online coursework platform. It's like a complete school system online. And oh, okay. there's a lot of, that goes into it. The courses are um, developed and recorded, video recorded by certified teachers. So they're constantly updated, um, but it's, nationally accredited and then also according to state standards so it ensures that students are moving in line with their state mandates it also has ap programs tailorable to ieps um, students can move ahead as far as they like in it there's no glass ceiling um, but there's also no finessing the system it's within the teacher's control not within the student's control so they can't jump around and but it is everything available does it uh, does it provide a um a reporting service or does the teacher have to gather and report themselves? No, it, it actually automates the reporting service. So it keeps record of the students' milestones. That um, is cool. It's fantastic. I mean, it, it's, it took the, it takes teaching to a whole new level. It took out yeah. the, yeah, it's amazing. But I remember also, my teachers complaining just about that part of it. Yeah. Like, I mean, in my class, like I'm in like grade school and mm -hmm. I'd have my teachers complaining about what they're doing and which, what they wish they had. Right. And 
it seems to me a lot of what you're saying is what my teachers growing up, which they had. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, it's a no brainer. The kids sit down, they and it's not. I mean, it's what colleges do. You go into your college class. You know, my my SPC math class. I went and I sat down. We logged into my SPC in the angel system. And we did our math course online while our teacher was supplementing on the whiteboard. And so this allows us to do the cool. same thing, take that sophistication into elementary, middle and high school. It has credit recovery. I mean, there's just, yeah. And it sends automatic reports home to parents too. So it takes out that, you know, that uh, element of having to convince or, um, you know, always bring parents up to speed. That's automated weekly. So. That That is beautiful. Well, I mean, <laughs> It, it's uh it seems like a win-win for everybody it truly is it truly is and we can ensure the students aren't missing anything there's no room for error so. and more importantly teachers get to do more time doing what their act job actually is yes, exactly and because each student even if they're all in sixth grade that they're, they're moving along at their pace within the course mm -hmm. pushed <laughs> but moving along you know at their pace so it takes out that um teachers having to juggle with what to teach and how to teach it according to 20 different learning styles. So they can focus on the students. Of course, of course. So Jeremiah is speaking in my ear. He is very wise. He's saying, please save something for the presentation so we don't run out of stuff to talk about. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> oh, I can always elaborate. It's good. <laughs> I know that's, that's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking this is a whole, uh, deep <laughs> like, yeah yeah it's like it's like you got an ocean of stuff to talk about yeah. so th this is but this is pretty cool so um for anyone who's been interested in, in homeschooling techniques ingenuity seems like a nice application to apply and uh, we were also talking about uh jamie's before we started the video jamie's use of discord with her class so um uh, I've used Discord, but I have to say, I'm probably a lot less adept at it than you are already. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. So Discord is a way, it's a, it's a, if I can explain it correctly, it's an application that you can download on your phone. You can go access online that allows you to create chat groups mm -hmm. where um, you can also share content. It's not just uh, messages. It, yeah. You can practically share everything and you can create your own rules. You can create your own automation, like a robot that if someone says X, Y, Z, the robot will say A, B, C, and, and it's amazing. And yeah. even the robot can be taught to do stuff too. Mm -hmm. The bot that you uh, program. Mm -hmm. So like, yeah, I, I, I'm aware, but like I've never done, besides messaging and maybe a file or two, any of the rest. <laughs> Interesting. It is. It's a fascinating platform, but it works very well for um, just creating separate servers for teachers for real time mm. chat without having to give out personal information. Yeah. You know. Um, yeah, it was really effective. And emails take time to respond to. You know, so it allowed for real time classroom even when we were dispersed for COVID. So. And that's what we all want, right? Yes, <laughs> we do. Keep the connections. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So uh, I, I know that uh, you, there's like a lot of lessons in the schoolhouse that uh, students have to learn, as in, um, you know, lessons beyond the books. Yeah. So I hope that we can talk about that as I just recognize now it turned 11 a.m. when we <laughs> actually start our sessions. But uh, I want to get that uh, definitely out there if you have a chance, like maybe in the questions time. Yeah. It's in the PowerPoint. <laughs> and, uh, you. yeah yeah but. i bet it is that's what we all got to look forward to <laughs> love the questions i love the questions so um everybody is 11 a.m yeah, well 1101 here um 11 a.m eastern edt and we are right now starting the session high explorations with jamie manfra we are so happy to have you here today jamie and if you don't mind i'm going to read your uh introduction so that people know who you are. Well, give me one moment as I pull that up. And here we go. Miss Jamie Manfra is the principal and founder of SLS Micro School, a registered private school in the state of Florida. She graduated from the Blue Heron Academy of Healing Arts and Sciences, for short BHA, 
in Grand Rapids, Michigan back in 2002, where she completed a four-year program in naturopathic medicine. That is amazing, by the way, Jamie. Like, <laughs> naturopathic medicine is amazing. I, I, you're the second person in my whole life I've met who's done this. Her ability to quickly master topics and then implement them in classroom instruction led to an explosive career in education. She taught naturopathic education from 2002 to 2004 before relocating to Florida, where she was given the opportunity to work remotely and spearheaded a successful e-learning department of BHA. Her leadership in online curriculum development allowed her to diversify her skills from adult classroom education to the use of technology in education. Now, this week's topic, the modern school is the micro school. As a short summary, in 2008, Jamie's focus began to shift from teaching adults to the education of children. Her long held volunteer services, including serving as a board of, uh, as a, on the board of directors for FloridaCharacter.org, a state leader character development education program, and the animation of junior youth groups, her dedication to service in rapport with the community led children to the organic development of a Baha'i inspired school based on the ideology of service learning. As the school gained momentum, it needed to remain affordable for the families. Jamie and her team managed to navigate the complexity of state regulations for scholarship funding. This long process forced Jamie and her team to transform themselves from grassroots pioneers to savvy advocates of school choice programs, legislature, and freedom in education. From six students in 2012 to 50 students and a school campus, SLS is a thriving example of modern education built through sheer determination. Jamie and school staff continue to refine every aspect of the micro school, a school that is intentionally limited in size in order to provide quality education human connections, and long-term retention of its students. The school's organic development from the grassroots level forced Jamie to become a Renaissance woman in every aspect of school development and operation. Her and her team's experience provide a valuable resource in the replication of modern schools, which are micro schools. So with that said, Jamie, thank you for coming on today. We're very happy to have you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, it's funny because I think everybody usually says, I've heard it a hundred times and I know it too, that the more you learn and more you experience, it feels like the less you know, you know, so it makes these yeah. presentations increasingly difficult when you're, um, you know, trying to filter through experiences and hone in on what would be important and applicable to the people that you're speaking to. So thank you very much for having me. Th thank you. Thank you. So um, I am uh, happy to say that we are ready for the presentation. So as soon as you wanna uh, start it, I'm going to put the mute on and listen. And if you want to ask questions, anybody who's watching wants to ask questions, please, please, please put your questions down in the chat and we will open the floor for you to ask your question as well. So please look at the chat down below and put your question in and we're happy to answer. Yes. Yeah, the questions are greatly appreciated because I really do try to prepare um, presentations uh, in anticipation of questions I usually get or questions that I know are you know common right now. Um, but I always miss many, many things. So questions, I don't, even if the PowerPoint is interrupted to answer a question, I really do welcome the dialogue. So I will go ahead and then and share my screen. Is that okay for the, okay, for a PowerPoint presentation. Can everyone see that okay? Yes, the view, the view is correct, yes. Okay, excellent. Um, so yes, this presentation is um, on the modern school is the micro school. Um, and subheading would be service learning, the modernization of education. Um, so I'm going to present on a model of education that's very applicable to the world that we're in, uh, surprisingly doable um, and may challenge some of the common held beliefs or um, strong loyalties that we have to what is currently a very large industrialized public school uh, system. So I'm asking everyone to 
Uh, keep in mind, I tried to be as diplomatic as possible, but I am opinionated. <laughs> so I want to can I give a disclaimer from the bat um, that I hope I don't offend anyone. And I hope that uh, what I have included in the presentation raises as many questions as it answers so that we can together move in the right direction with this dialogue. Um, but if you forget everything you know or think you know about large education systems, then this will be much easier to uh, receive as it is. So um, one of my biggest inspirations in uh, forming the micro school is um, Buckminster Fuller. And he was just an amazing, amazing human being, but also just very forward thinking, just a complete revolutionary when it came to mathematics and science and how to build something that's um, strong and more, but with less. So one of the quotes that really um, inspired me was when he said, you, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. So that makes reform um, much easier when you think about it that way. So um, I added to that what are words that are uh, playing in my head constantly, but um, the time has come to build something so simple, the micro school so simple, but so fundamentally different in education that our communities have no choice but to be transformed. Trust this process, the opportunity is at our fingertips. So moving ahead with those two things in mind, in this presentation, I um, wanted to start out by giving everyone sort of a, a list of things to look for uh, within the slides. So we're gonna look for um, and cover one, the, the treatment of students in the Baha'i faith um, and the role of the teachers in the Baha'i faith. Um, I'm a Baha'i, <laughs> actually, I, I'm a Baha'i and um, that that's my religion, um, but Baha'is essentially uh, believe that all the religions and all the people came from one God and that religion is a um, is an unfolding, that there's no no just one truth, the truth is the same, but um, social teachings change throughout religions and that they're meant to be different, the differences are meant to be there. Um, so it, specifically in terms of the micro school and the service learning model, we're gonna speak how that fits with the, with the Baha'i inspired principles. Um, so that's, you'll see a, a common thread run through this presentation as well that could be considered and is considered Baha'i inspired. So one, we'll cover the treatment of students in the Baha'i faith and the role of the teachers. Um, two, it's very important before talking about the future or where we need to go to advance civilization, it's extremely important to understand where we've been and why things are the way they are. So we are gonna go over the his, uh, historical accomplishments of the large school systems. We're also going to examine schools in poor versus elite communities and how free market, and this is where, this is where it gets controversial sometimes and feel free to disagree with me. <laughs> um, but we're gonna examine how poor versus elite communities and how free market school choice and competition in education can abolish inequality. Um, so again, questions and thoughts on that because I know there is a fierce loyalty to the public school system. So um, entertaining this thought without feeling like, you know, there's some betrayal is challenging sometimes, but I'm very ready to have that dialogue um, and listen to uh, views. So um, another important thing to cover is we're going to examine how the consciousness of humanity has been heightened by technology and why school systems need to change to accommodate that. Um, we're going to accept that the reality, or accept the reality that good schools are the result of a triad, teachers, administrators, and families working together. We're going to look at elevating and trusting our teachers, review how micro schools operate efficiently in modern society, and how they create equal opportunity for all socioeconomic demographics to use the power of school choice to build their new systems. So that's what we will cover in this PowerPoint if you wanna <laughs> watch for those key things. So service learning, this is a question I get quite often and this is probably the one thing I'm the most excited to speak about. Um, and there is, no, there is no set system within the Baha'i writings are vast. There's no set system that says this is a Baha'i school. So traditionally we've tried to implement Baha'i principles within a large school system that matches what already exists. But in order to really come up with a concrete model of Baha'i inspired education, you have to search through Baha'i writings and psychological studies and use logic and reason 
to assemble a puzzle of what that could look like. And it's multidimensional, it's not flat. So based on my experience and my research in psychology, in um, school systems, uh, classroom experience for the past eight years, I've come to the determination that thus far that Baha'i inspired education can only be accomplished in a small group, a group small enough to be efficient in learning and impactful in application can only be accomplished with a small group, hence the micro school. Um, my idea for, for service learning as a full-time school system, um, the idea of service learning is not brand new. It's existed for a really long time in colleges um, for decades. Um, this idea of doing a service project or being of benefit to community um, is not new. We want our children to do that. Um, waiting until the university level, I think, is far too long. And school systems are currently just far too large to really implement effective community service. But families yet are far too busy to do it on the outside. So we have to figure out how to implement service within the school in an efficient way in order to really affect the human, like human hearts, the hearts of children. So to make service a pattern of life, basically. So the idea of service learning, um, this one writing for me personally stood out. And this was this is what lit my fire eight years ago to develop a school system based in service learning. And the writing was um, that service to the world of humanity should be obligatory. Every student should know with perfect certainty that he is the brother of the people of all religions and nations and that he should be without religious, racial, national, patriotic, or political bias, so that he may find the thoughts of universal peace and the love of humankind firmly established in his heart. So when you look at that and you take word, you take some of those, those words and really look at them, um, that he should know with perfect certainty, that takes time. It takes time to know with perfect certainty that you are the brother, of all people in all religions and nations. That takes a lot of dialogue. There's a lot of divisiveness in the world. So for students to know with perfect certainty and to have the love of humankind firmly established in his heart, it doesn't say we need to introduce them to the idea of love of humankind or that we should um, mention <laughs> that they should be the brother of all people. We're talking about perfect certainty and firmly established in their heart. Therefore, service should be the absolute foundation of all schools. That's how, that's how I feel about that. <laughs> it's a very strong stance on that. Um, so we're moving on to, um, as we talked about, I'm having a sip of water. Everyone can take sips of water. <laughs> I work with kids a lot. Or a so bite of food. I'm very enthusiastic, yes. And I can't see a bite of food, a whole yes, big bite of food. Of food. Water. Yep. <laughs> so we're gonna move on to um, the part where we talked about, uh, just briefly look at the treatment of children or students and also the role of the teacher. Um, there's so, There are so many writings. When I say so many writings, I mean, there's so many writings in the Baha'i faith about the treatment of children. Um, and really there's so many psychological studies that we have now, like psychology of the, of the brain and the mind's behavioral psychology has come so far since the first public schools that we know how, we really do know between science and spiritual training, we know how students and children should be treated. We know how, how teachers should be interacting with students. Fitting the large school systems to that is very difficult because there just isn't time in the classroom to really accomplish what needs to be accomplished according to a Baha'i model. So I extracted just a few of the points that I've seen in the writings, but in the best interest of time, but there it's vast. So specifically um, in the Baha'i writings, there's no corporal, corporal physical punishment allowed or the vilification of students. And the, direct, the exact writing says um, that should a child need chastisement or punishment, but with use of, um, by means of reason, by a parent and also by, by a teacher too, we'll, we'll apply that there because there are no writings that support corporal punishment or the vilification of students in schools either. So 
The word vilification I use specifically because it's very important. The word vilification means to make a child feel like a villain. So it's extremely important that we that we take that specific word that Abdul Baha used and really take that to heart because he not only said that they should be counseled by means of reason, but that it's it is not permissible to strike or to vilify a child. So when we look at this idea of shaming children for their behavior, that is not supported in the Baha'i writings, nor is it supported in psychological studies. Not to say that we should allow or be permissive of adverse behaviors. Bad character traits obviously need to be pruned and redirected, but that it takes time. So moving on to the next point, um, in the Baha'i writings, it does say the counsel for, or counsel for rectification. So teachers need to use counsel for rectification of conduct to improve behavior over a long period of time, requires a lot of patience and requires, it requires time. And larger schools just do not have the time for that in their classroom. Um, also the character is developed through, through influence, not lecture or book learning. So we're concerned with the character of children because these children are going to grow up. They're going to be our doctors, our lawyers. Um, they'll be in charge of the next, the next phase of humanity. So Nurturing their character is extremely important and it's found all throughout the Baha'i writings. It's very important to note that the word character is not an umbrella term. Character education cannot be taught as an umbrella subject. The word character by definition means the qualities that are unique to an individual. Character is unique. So in order to influence the character of a child, you must know that child. You must get to know that child very well to understand their character, because that is not a blanket term. It's not a virtues book or a virtues curriculum that's just taught like math or taught like English. It requires the teacher to know the child because again, the definition of the word character means the qualities that are unique to that human being and it's different for everyone. Um, it is taught through influence. It is not taught by lecture or book learning. So um, methodical moral education means allowing students to witness and experience moral dilemmas and the process of reaching an elevated conclusion. So to model good character or to um, teach students good moral education does not mean acting like you're perfect. It doesn't mean insisting that they be perfect mm -hmm. or obey rules. In fact, it means letting them see you wrestle with a almost making a bad decision, like, do this? Should I do that? Should I let you go 10 minutes early to play, even though you've been misbehaving the entire time and no one's gotten any work done? No, you know what? I think we're going to do the right thing and we're going to sit here and finish up our work before going out. You have to let them see you walk that line and see you wrestle in the process. They also have to be allowed to wrestle with the process. There has to be time for that within the classroom in order for them to understand that um, moral, moral conduct is it's a moving, living, breathing, multidimensional thing. It's not just expecting perfection. It's practicing and achieving perfection. Um, so those are things that are paramount in the Baha'i faith um, that are difficult to pull out in a large school system, but also strongly supported by psychological studies and science um, that are easily implemented in a micro school. So my next slide, I'm gonna pop to because a lot of times when we talk about micro schools or small schools and um, moral education and whatnot, we really think about small children. But in fact, again, this is where school systems have to catch up with the science and the psychology is that we cannot discard the opportunity in our adolescence and youth. Because what we've found now through, um, through brain studies and scans and whatnot is that there's a second period of vulnerability and opportunity in our children. And that is between the ages of um, nine and 14, 11 and 15, right in there. It's the middle school ages. So um, in the Baha'i Faith, we have a junior youth program that specifically works with children of that age, but there's a real disconnect in the school system um, regarding the expectations of uh, middle school and high school age kids. And the behavior that's expected from them is given very little um, very little development, hands-on development, the way we do when, when children are from zero to three, birth to three, there's a lot of leeway and a lot of nurturing that happens. Um, but we kind of think from then on that children grow linearly like adults do. As they get taller, they get better. That is not the case. There's this period of time where their brain switches, the amygdala lights up, the frontal lobe shuts down. They're afraid 
they experience a lot of fear because the emotional center of their brain is lighting up, but the, the frontal cortex shut down. Now they're not even able to reason through their fear. They're just feeling it. And they feel it in schools. And we know when the reptile portion of the brain lights up, the amygdala, that that fight or flight response is triggered and students are not learning at that point. If they feel they're in a hostile environment at school for middle and high school, they are not learning. So what are we accomplishing? Can you, so explain, think, what the, can you explain what the amygdala is for sure, people yeah, who, who don't know how it functions and stuff? Oh, yes, absolutely. So the amygdala is the emotion center of the brain. It's like the fight or flight response. So humans have um, basically four brains within their brain. Um, the first is the same brain that we see with reptiles. It's a bundle of nerves that trigger the fight or flight. It's a very primitive. Um, then they have like the mammal brain is the next one to be developed similar to, you know, um, that's where we see the similarities related to apes or to primates, even though we know humans are not that. Um, and then there's a whole nother section of brain and functioning of brain that makes us human, where we have much more capacity to make decisions for decision-making, skill learning. Um, so what's interesting about brain development, brains brains and human beings don't stop developing until they're well into their 20s. And now really they're looking at uh, the pruning process exceeding far beyond that if people are academically stimulated. So what's interesting is that between the ages of zero to three and nine to 14, the emotional center of the brain is lights up the most. So in essence, the junior youth period or the middle school period is like a second toddlerhood. So if a child has not been properly um, treated when they're younger, there's a whole nother window of vulnerability and opportunity that arises in middle school that, that if we treat those children correctly, we once again, and really are careful actually in how we treat them, that we actually have an opportunity once again to, to reach their heart. It's like the amygdala, because it's emotion centered, is like a, a straight line directly to their heart. But it also requires a lot of understanding and patience because you're looking at adult sized children <laughs> who, who you feel like should be making the right decisions, who are not necessarily making the right decisions, but it's literally because of brain development. So it's very important, I think, to take the psychological understanding now into the school systems and create systems that really, really do address and maximize these different parts of childhood. So we have a question from uh, Alex Chernovsky. And the question is, so would there be greater learning at home during this pandemic? Um, for those who are watching this after the fact, people have been home for months now and not even going physically to school. Right. So people have been spending a lot of time inside not actually going out to do anything? Yes, that's a really good question. Um, I, I have to say that largely depends on the home environment and the school system. Um, if a student does not have proper access at home to technology, um, they can fall behind in the school system and that can create a lot of fear and issues. If a student has been raised to think that their learning is not only dependent on the school system, and at home, they have access to outside activities, um, you know, uh, student-led projects, things like that. I think it, I think it could be fine, um, but I think a lot of it depends on what what is the the family and the student's perceived need of school in order to be educated. If they perceive they need the school room in order to be educated, then that create that in and of itself is a problem. Um, but I do think for students who do not are not limited to their education just being tied to the school system. They're at home, they have a nurturing home environment and access to outside activities. I think they're probably progressing fine through this. So it's a good question. It's just such a multifaceted answer, <laughs> but it's a great question. It's the question that's on everyone's minds. Absolutely. With technology though, and with a smaller school, there's no reason they shouldn't be advancing extremely well. And that was our experience with the micro school is we hit we didn't hit any real roadblocks when COVID happened. So I hope that, hope that, does that you think adequately answer it? Nodding. I, I think okay. that means yes, the answer to this question. Yeah. And I'd be happy to go in some more detail yeah. about how, <laughs> about how our micro school adapted to the COVID experience too, I think is another, um, another reason the micro school model was so effective, um, but that we briefly touch on that later too. So, um, so this is, okay, so here's where we get real. <laughs> 
because it, you know, there's a lot of like, there's a lot of philosophy and a lot of lofty ideals on how schools should be run in education, right? There's a lot of curriculum developers and, um, but we have to bring it in and make it applicable to families and like, how do we keep it real, right? So the little known truth is actually that um, private schools, which is what I have, I have a private micro school, um, they already exist. It's not new. The reality is that parents can already choose a school for their child. The unfortunate reality is that that only happens usually if they can afford it. So this, this is, it doesn't destroy the public school system for private schools to exist. They're already there. Parents are already taking their students out of the public school system and putting them in the private school system. The problem is most people think they can't afford it. And in some states they can't afford it. Um, so the next point is that elite and upper class families are already exercising school choice. They're already, they've been doing it for a very long time by paying for private schools, which is an economic injustice. But later on, I'll explain what states and how you can actually pay for private schools. A lot of families don't know this, but you can pay for private schools. The state pays for the school for your child. It's available to everyone. So that's a point I'm going to get out later <laughs> as effectively as possible. Um, another point is that the middle and working class families remain mostly in public schools, while um, the common understanding is that elite and wealthy families are placing their children in private schools. So uh, another point is that property taxes and school assessments and grading system keep conditions. There's no arguing that, we know it. Um, currently, there are upper and middle class families exercising school choice every day. and. The question is, so why isn't this choice widely exercised by lower and middle class families? And I would assert it's because they don't know. They don't actually know that the, the choice is there. So um, just in briefly touching on the history of the public school system, because like I said, in order to know where we need to go, we have to look at where we've been and accept what that's accomplished, but also look at what it didn't accomplish and then talk about how to make it modern. So um, this is another really multi-layered topic. There was so much that went into and it had a great effect on the development of public school systems in our nation. But I chose two specific points um, to highlight, look at why it worked, what we learned and where we should go with it. The first is the age grading in the school system. Why are children uh, separated according to numerical age? So that was a concept originated um, at the, the Quincy Grammar School in Boston. There was an educator, um, his name was Horace Mann. And he had a lot of influence within the Quincy Grammar School. So he went to Perugia for a while and studied the school systems in Perugia. And what he found was um, that their separation by age, separating students into grades by age, grade age grading is what it's called, um, allowed for an efficient way of um, really controlling and training the masses, a large group of people. So that's where the age grading system took away the um, one room schoolhouse, and we started moving towards what we see in the public school systems today. So the question is, what did this accomplish? Well, it accomplished a lot, actually. One of the things that it accomplished was, because you have to give credit where credit is due, one thing it accomplished was it gave a comparative insight of age-related learning capacity. As we grouped all students together according to age, and now we can actually look at what can they do. So what we learned is over the past 10 decades of the school system that um, children do not learn the same according to numerical age. That there's a lot more that goes into their academic understanding than just the age associated with their birth. Um, so what do we do with that? So we have to make it modern, Baha'i-based, science-based. So students in developmentally appropriate groups, according to capacity and ability, balanced, not only according to numerical age. So in the Baha'i writings, it actually instructs us to separate students according to, in groups according to capacity and ability. Um, so that coupled with uh, just psychological understanding and science, we know we don't want, even if a, a middle schooler is at a third grade math level, we don't put a middle schooler in a third grade math class. So <laughs> you have to be reasonable and balanced in your application of this. And group students from, you know, ages, 11 to 13, no matter what grade they're in in math, with technology, you can give them a curriculum that's appropriate to their development, um, but group them that way, not all according to age. So there's a lot more variance that's available now, and that can be accomplished with a micro school. Um, okay, so another thing 
and what did it accomplish? It also accomplished um, the means for comparative observation for behavioral capacity according to age. So what did we learn? We learned that children do not have the same capacity of behavior according to age. So one very well um, behaved, uh, mild tempered eight-year-old does not look the same as a really active, adventurous, mountain climbing eight-year-old. <laughs> so the numerical age of a child does not determine their capacity for behavior. Um, and so where do we go with that? We, with a micro school, we can provide an environment and psychological variances for a deeper understanding of behavior. So if, if education schools are really to accomplish two things, one is to maximize that child's potential. The second thing really is to observe human behavior so that we as a collective as humanity can better understand how to advance civilization. So we have a lot of observational and comparative studies based on an age grading system. But what the micro school allows is um, a change in environment and allows for psychological variances for a deeper understanding of behavior by uh, shifting the focus from children of certain ages to children of certain capacity um, strategically. So in a very organized way. <laughs> So another thing of um, what did this accomplish, age grading. It also um, provided comparative observation for age-related gender differences um, by grouping girls and boys in the same class. How do they, how do they respond at different ages, right? So, um, or at the same age, but dependent on gender. So what we found was generally there are differences in brain development according to gender, but to varying degrees. So microschools provide some academic education for all children, the same academic education. No change from boys to girls, which we know in the Baha'i faith, it says that, um, that boys and girls should be given the same education and because that has an, an equalizing force. Um, but with more time to observe environmental, social, and spiritual influences for a multifaceted understanding of gender-related student behavior. Um, so those are things that are accomplished with uh, what did we what did we accomplish? What have we learned though, and where can we go with this? What changes can be made to modernize education? So a few more points. Um, another thing that it accomplished was more students could be accommodated. This was important. This was one of the points of age grading. You could accommodate more students as a as an entire school. If you divide them by age, they're easier to control the interactions. The, the, interaction is um, less multifaceted as it would be with different age children. So um, what did we learn from that? We learned that large classes of the same age students require more classroom management time because when you have 20 to 25 eight year olds or 20 to 25 16 year olds um, that are all behaving within the same spectrum of age but varyingly, it, it requires a lot of redirection from the teacher. <laughs> especially in large classes of all the same developmental age. So what can we do with that? Smaller classes with um, older students, avail availability increases peer mentoring opportunities. So within a micro school, within large school systems, you typically have elementary is one school, middle school, and then high school. Within a micro school, if you have K through 12, then you have separate, separate sections so that each developmental age is honored. But at the same time, youth and older students may be available for peer mentoring opportunities um, to mature, to be mature role models um, and uh, to bring out closer teacher-student relationships creates longevity and behavior modification. So that's not the old schoolhouse. The one-room schoolhouse, this is not what we're talking about. We're talking about a, a school that's small enough to have the different grades in it, um, but still makes the older grades available to mentor the younger ones. So it's it's not the, the one room schoolhouse mentality. Um, so another thing it accomplished is students change teachers every year. So they're, they're exposed to new adults. And for secondary schools, they change seven times a day. So interestingly, what did we learn from this? <laughs> we learned that um, relearning your new students every year takes valuable time out of the classroom. So again, we pop back to the idea of character being um, the ability to, to know the unique qualities of individual students. That's how we teach character. Um, but when you're relearning a new group of students every year, then you're, every teacher is hit with a, a learning curve, uh, like a curveball as far as um, time management in the classroom goes, because you don't know the students that are coming in. So, um, how do we, so how do we get around that or how do we elevate that? So we wanna retain students 
hopefully for their entire childhood, because we love them, um, throughout their childhood creates longevity and behavior and academic development, as well as connections in the family. It allows you to connect to their families. Um, a new exposure can be accomplished with guest teachers. So we don't lose that exposure to new adults um, and new teachers. We want that. We want a, a rich variety of educators for all of our students. But with a micro school, that can be accomplished by taking the, the school group out into the community to volunteer or to have guest teachers come into the school. The time, there's time for that. So that way we don't lose the exposure. Um, but that you grow with your children. So another thing it accomplished, it allowed for, or yeah, what did it accomplish? So it allowed for specialized teacher training according to specific age-related needs. So it really allowed um, the school system to hone on curriculum according to age, and then to train the teachers for that age, specialized in third grade math or, you know, what have you. So, but what did we learn? We learned that it limited teachers perceived personal ability to teach and understand all stages of childhood. So although it allowed for a highly, um, highly personalized training or specific training, specialized training, it also limited teachers perceived abilities where um, a teacher who maybe specialized in elementary education, K through two or second grade, um, they don't perceive themselves as being capable of teaching a sixth grade class. Although they may be capable of teaching a sixth grade class, their perceived ability has become limited. Um, and they're rarely able to step from the primary to the secondary level. So um, that's what we've learned is that it, it ultimately specialized maybe, but also limited teachers. Um, so how do we get around that? So micro school or elevated micro school teachers are specialized, but not limited to specific grades. So when you're in a school or micro school with um, K through 12, or like we have mostly middle and high school students, um, the middle school teacher is exposed to high school students, even if it's just observationally, even if they're not teaching the classes, they, they can observe the behavior of high school students and start to understand that and associate with those high school teachers. Um, which may slowly build their capacity and their desire to interact with and teach older students. So we have growth on the part of the students and the teachers with the micro school model. It's not so limited. Um, another thing that it accomplished, and here's where the outdated mentality really shows. So textbook development according to grade could be reused every year. Um, but what did we learn? We learned that textbooks and standardized curriculum still becomes outdated um, and that teacher training is exhausting. <laughs> ask any public school teacher and they'll tell you. And lesson planning um, is like reinventing the wheel. Now that we have technology and automated um, curriculum systems and platforms available, at this point, uh, teachers creating curriculum or lessons plans for their group of students to, to meet all of those varying levels is really reinventing the wheel because now everything's automated. Um, so how do we elevate that? So micro schools use automated academics, which I talked about with John at the very beginning, but I would be happy to answer questions about the system that we use. Um, but automated academics through technology with instantaneous updates. So no need for new textbooks to be manufactured and distributed. Um, it's, it's automatically updated within the platform because everything's online now. Um, it also allows for time for IT troubleshooting, <laughs> which does become a problem in the classroom sometimes, the Wi-Fi, <laughs> can't connect to Wi-Fi. But again, with a micro school and with automated academics, you know, if I'm not worried about my lesson plan getting into the brain of 20 fifth graders, then I have time to troubleshoot IT problems. Um, and the teachers really can focus on the students' connections and learning specifically on individual students. So um, we're gonna move on now to where it can there be controversial. Oh, yes, happy to answer. So we got a question on uh, Facebook asking about what we did mention about ingenuity and um, how they can access that program, how, what they should search to find it or how to spell it. Yes, so, uh, ingenuity, sure, absolutely. It's um, E-D-G-E. E, E? It starts with the, <laughs> oh, wow, I wouldn't have even known that. All right, so. <laughs> Okay, E D G E N U I T Y. Yep, you got it. Okay, cool. It's thanks to Jenny Jackson in the comments, by the way. So, yes, <laughs> thanks. Miss Jenny's our math teacher, our high school math and uh, <laughs> math and science. Thank you, Miss Jenny. <laughs> um, yeah, she'd be great to have on here too. <laughs> um, but yes, so ingenuity. It's important. It's important to note that um, it's not necessarily a good option for homeschoolers because it it 
is licensed to schools or school groups. Um, but if a group of homeschoolers together wanted to purchase it, that's that that would be a great idea. But it is one of, and I, I actually feel strongly that until really good um, coursework is available that does not allow students to bounce around, it is worth paying for online platforms. Like if if we're channeling school money and school funds into something, whether it be textbooks or large facilities, we need to channel it into the children's academic education via sophisticated online programs. And Ingenuity is one of those. Um, and it does not allow children or students to bounce around like Khan Academy or some of the free source ones are, are great if you can keep your student on track or you have a student who's motivated to just stay on track. But I would largely say that is not the case. They need something that keeps them just moving ahead. So, um, but look into Ingenuity and any questions on that, I'm happy to answer too. But there are definitely reasons that um, schools to establish schools and for those schools to utilize funding to purchase sophisticated platforms that ensure the students are moving ahead unquestionably um, instead of just using free source ones and saying we have online technology classrooms it is just not effective um so uh, this is another thing i'm opinionated on <laughs> only through trial and error really um <laughs> and consultation and observation so um, so the second thing I chose to analyze as far as the history of public schools is another thing that's very, it's very much um, in dialogue everywhere right now. And so we're going to look at the desegregation in schools from kind of an unorthodox standpoint, because it may not go in line with the um, palatable narrative on either side right now. Um, so specifically, we'll talk about um, what occurred after uh, Brown versus Board and the Brown two decision. So so generally, what, what did it accomplish? What did integration accomplish? Well, it accomplished a lot. It accomplished the recognition of equal intellectual capacity of the entire human race by bringing, and we're specifically talking about America, by bringing black and white students into the same classroom. So we have black students and white students within the same classroom. And now we know that students and human beings do not have intellectual, intellectual capacity based on skin color. Like we know that thanks to integration. <laughs> so, but what did we learn? We learned that physical integration failed to establish a truly equitable system because intrinsic anti-Black attitudes were not rectified. So although um, the students who fought and families fought for integration were able to, to prove that their intellectual, not that they should have had to prove it, but proved that their intellectual capacity was the same, if not superior, depending on the student to white children. Um, but it, we still, because anti-Black um, attitudes during that time and, and currently were not rectified, it still didn't really make it equal. It really didn't. So six decades later, so how do we make it modern, Baha'i-based and science-based? Well, micro schools advance integration ideals because it was an ideal, not that it was achieved, but it was an ideal um, by providing efficient education and impactful human relationships and time for both head and heart education. So when you have a micro school and you have a diverse student body, you have time in a micro school, especially with automated online academics um, for impactful human relationships and proper education where anti-black attitudes um, and myths can then be discussed, lovingly consulted on and rectified. Um, so another thing, what did it accomplish? Opportunities for positive exposure and positive experiences between students who would not otherwise have been around each other to have experiences together, would not have otherwise connected. So, but what did we learn? So we learned that opportunities for negative exposure and negative experiences were also there um, with very little time for guidance and conflict or racial conflict to repair cross racial misunderstandings in children. So oftentimes the experiences were fitting a home narrative. So if a student observed two other students fighting or arguing, um, the bad guy within the fight would fit the home narrative. And if it was a racist home narrative, that's a problem. And there's no time to really correct that. So from the outside integration was great. It absolutely needed to happen. Um, but from within we, when you look at old interviews of um, the first students who were integrated and their children, what you, you learn that although 
it established the legal right. It didn't. It did not establish an equitable environment within the school. There's always there's always exceptions to that, but this is where we get really real, right? So let's make it modern. So micro schools implement mindful and voluntary student diversification with time to discuss conflicts, guide friendships, and involve families too for a deeper understanding of one another. So now we, the dialogue or the conflict resolution does not just happen between two students, but rather can also involve the family in the consultation, um, which really helps bring about maturity and evolution on all sides. So what is another thing that it accomplished? Um, it accomplished the, we established the equal right or the legal right for equal education opportunities in America. But what did it not accomplish? Well, we learned it did not actually succeed in establishing equal opportunities. It established the legal right to opportunities, but it did not actually establish equal opportunities in education. Public schools are increasingly segregated. Segregation has actually increased in the past three decades, according to socioeconomic factors. And an example of this is when the first um, public school was, was integrated after, Brown, after um, Brown versus Board, that high school shut down for an entire year. And what they found was white families found some sort of schooling outside of the school system. It shut down for a year. The high school closed for a year after the integration, after the first black graduate. That's amazing. It also found, and it's something that's just not talked about, but it also, what that, what that found was that spurred the, um, the, the mass exodus of white families into neighboring neighborhoods, further, furthering the redlining, the issue of redlining. Um, and then also, mm -hmm. all right. It happens, yeah, and it happens common. I mean, that's that's why, if anything, that schools are still so segregated is because even though it established a legal right, white families and elite wealthy families moved out of neighborhoods. Public schools are what? They're zoned. They're zoned. You go there according to where you live. So white families just left, <laughs> got different houses in different neighborhoods, and those schools are highly funded. So did it actually accomplish in, like equal opportunity, especially if funds are based on property taxes. Public schools funds are based on property taxes. It just is what it is. And um, the level of achievement or perceived achievement of the school, when you have students who are in extremely poor neighborhoods and the school is completely run down and I'm not making this up, you can Google it. Um, the achievement, they, they won't be achieving. I mean, we're judging the achievement based on what, you know? So this is just the reality. I'm just keeping it real. It can all be Googled later, <laughs> but we did. It's, it's great that it established the legal right for integration, but it did not actually establish the equal opportunity. So how does that, how do we fix that with a modern school? Because this needs to be fixed. It's getting worse, not better. Um, school choice and free market education, level the playing field by placing the power in the hands of parents and teachers, not dependent on zoning, achievement, assessments, or property taxes. So school choice and free market education is available to everyone. It's available to everyone in most of the states now. It's just that in a lot of poor and minority and areas of poverty, they're not told about the opportunities. So that's one of my objectives is also to inform people that those opportunities are there. Um, but when you put the power back in the hands of parents and teachers, not it's the curriculum development and the system itself is not dependent on politicians like the federal school systems, public school systems. And it's politicians don't have their hands in it when businessmen do not have their hands in it. And the power is in the hands of the, te of the teachers and the parents, specifically the teachers. Then you will see education change. Then you will see quality community schools that really take care of their students. So um, yeah, we have to put the, the competition back in education because why not? What are we afraid of? We have to trust our teachers and our parents. So, um, so a little bit more on desegregation. So what did it accomplish? It dispelled myths regarding skin color and how it relates to learning and behavior because it forced that integration. So, um, but what did we learn? We learned that neighborhood school districts zoning and through property taxes quickly robbed communities of the ability to equalize and maximize school facilities and resources, the economic divide worsened. So again, because the funding is uh, according to property tax, um, that even if, even if we had gone in the right direction of really equalizing society, that we were robbed of that opportunity as soon as families started moving and other schools were created. Um, it just didn't have enough time to succeed. So 
make it modern, the high-based and science-based, small community schools require a triad of work between teachers, families, and community who are invested in and can afford facility, because they're small, facility and resources through state scholarships, which do exist, and we'll go into that. Micro schools are easily updated because they're small <laughs> and more affordable um, to maintain than large institutionalized school buildings because they're small. So I, I don't wanna throw you off, but I know we're going on to another subject and um, we're, we're continuing the subject, but uh, there, there's a, a few questions for definitions, like what redlining is. Oh, sure, uh, absolutely, yep. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so redlining is um, a term that's used to explain the way um, maps were divided according to home value. So um, the word ghetto is just, it's a terrible word, but what, what happened when after, after the Civil War, after slavery was abolished, <laughs> um, there was a, a max, mass like, exodus from the South all into all parts of the United States of, um, former slaves and their children, black communities. Um, and as they integrated into white society, one way that um, uh, uneducated, unenlightened white people, I'm just using plain terms. <laughs> like, I apologize if I offend anyone, um, but I'm just gonna speak plainly. Um, the way they maintained their communities and uh, asserted and pushed back seg into, seg into segregated society was by marking off rather like a Native Americans were um, taken to reservations and given the reservation. It's the same in essence, except that black people, white people left. So um, black communities were together then grouped and those places were redlined or outlined in red, those neighborhoods and the home values were not, were not raised. So those are the places where um, specifically they didn't give home loans in wealthier white neighborhoods to black families. Um, the home values in those red line neighborhoods were low. So that still exists today. And a lot of our parents, generation and grandparents, they can tell you exactly redlining, especially when they first started buying their own homes. So those red line neighborhoods, because those places are zoned to certain schools, um, schools that exist in red line neighborhoods are much more poor because the property taxes are so low, because the properties are low because it's a red line neighborhood. So that's how um, poor people were kept poor. And it's not just that. I think uh, you mentioned about the loans. Uh, banks will loan, well, wouldn't in redlining circumstances, they wouldn't loan to people to have any mobility. So they, they stopped uh, mobility through uh, also instituting classism as well. Yes, yes, absolutely. And this is like probably one of the biggest points of um, as people are wrestling with this idea of um, how to how to make things equal or are things equal? Haven't, haven't we done enough? Why is, why is this still a problem? When you look at red line neighborhoods and the, the um, system of poverty and the cycle of poverty, I think that's one of the most obvious examples of why racism is still an issue. Because if in those red line neighborhoods, people weren't majority black, we couldn't say it's racism, but it obviously still is. So, and the school system is suffering as well, so. So um, building on Carl Stefan's question, which he asked about redlining earlier, I want to ask you this. He says, but if you said there will be equal access to charter schools, et cetera, who's going to fund the charter schools? Good All question. Right? That's a great question. I'm glad somebody asked that because that's where I feel like I get too in depth of how the funding goes. But I think in order to really understand why this is possible without causing harm, it's really important to understand where the funding comes from. So charter schools and public schools are federally funded. So that's important to know. Those funds come from the same place. So when you see charter schools open up, does it mean that this public school is getting less funding? It does. It does. But I would ask this next question of why is that a problem? Because the system is not working. So if you open charter schools, nice charter schools, in areas where there's, um, there's a large public school of primarily black students, a worn down public school, why would we care if that public school gets defunded if we have better schools for our students? So that's the first thing. Charter schools and public schools are, are funded from the same source, but why are we protecting the public school system so fiercely? Um, the second thing is that private schools, private schools are not federally funded. They are not funded from the same source as public and charter. Private schools are privately funded according to tax credit scholarships. 
and um, the tax credit scholarships are done by state. So when you open up a private school, you do not directly take funding from charter or public schools. Private schools are not there to defund public schools. Private schools have a separate source of funding, which requires jumping through some hoops, but they can be micro schools. You can keep them small, um, just like I have done. Uh, their scholarships in the state of Florida, the scholars, for example. Oh, what was that? I think I heard a question. I think the sound went away. I don't. Um, so the funding for private schools is completely different. So I think that's important. That's important to know too. But again, um, we really have to examine why we're bothered by um, why we'd be bothered by the deterioration of the public school system because it's already deteriorating. Wealthy families and elite families and middle class families are already taking their students out to these other schools. So we really need minority um, areas and areas of poverty that don't know these these options are available to get ahead of that curve. Like beat them at their game, you know, because it's already happening. So in it, the scholarship, the scholarships are not there for wealthy people. They're there for kids with a reading gap, which is more prevalent in minority schools. They're there for uh, instances of bullying. You can take your child out of private school, out of public school and get a scholarship for instances of bullying, which you know occurs at all schools. They're there for students with um, diagnoses like ADD, ADHD, dyslexia. They're there for um, just middle-class, families and families who are poor, the tax credit scholarship is for those families, not for wealthy and elite families. Wealthy and elite families have to pay for private school, but there's more scholarship options available for middle and lower class families to take their child out and attend a smaller private school. So the, the opportunities are there. So that's very interesting that you talked about learning disabilities. Uh, mm -hmm. If you have one being actually eligible for funding, and that's mm -hmm. a question that was given to us through Facebook as well. Someone mm -hmm. was asking about uh, like ADHD and, and, and learning disabilities, mm -hmm. how the micro school platform, how the system works to help them. Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, it, it's really quite amazing. And this is where we have to be careful because I always, I always want to walk this line, but make sure that it's not worsening peripheral problems because that's, that's being responsible, right? Socially responsible. So if micro schools, um, if a teacher wanted to start a micro school that was specific to dyslexic students, um, and we have a lot of dyslexic students at our school, um, but it's, that's easily integrated with just normally cognitive students. So anyway, if a, a teacher wanted to start a micro school for dyslexic students, they could easily do that and start a micro school and fund it and pay their salary and pay for a classroom with 10 students. Can you imagine how that teacher would get those students ahead? If a teacher could really teach they, the way they wanted to teach and build relationships and really focus on ten, a group of 10 students, there would be no achievement gap. You know, and you take some, uh, you know, a poverty stricken neighborhood with an, a teacher from within that demographic. So she understands um, the challenges of these students. And she runs a classroom with 10 students from surrounding neighborhoods and they have a community garden and they, you know, she does, you know, all the academics and, She's reading with them. That closed the reading gap like that. One of the biggest issues in public school is the reading gap. It's the achievement gap. And all of my NAACP meetings that I've attended, what I'm always hearing about is the incredible reading gap within Black communities with Black students. That should not be the case. They, we already know that they can learn at the same level, if not more advanced, depending on the human being as white students. Why is there such a reading gap? So a, minor, a teacher from within a minority community that understands the culture and the, the surrounding neighborhoods and has a group of 10 students, rec center classroom, a little garden outside becomes an absolute pillar and beacon in the community. And her focus and love with those students and their families, it would the achievement gap would close in a heartbeat. And it's, fund, it's funded. That's what a lot of people don't understand. We can do this left and right. I get very passionate about this, but that's how I started. Any other questions? <laughs> like, don't get me started. These these are great. These are great. Uh, there, there is another question since we were on the subject of redlining. Uh, actually, Alex Boyson has a question. Where, where's Alex's question? Uh, Jeremiah, you said he has a question. Didn't get it. Alex, are you there? Can you unmute? I'm right here. Thank you. Great. So what's your question? 
Yes, uh, <clears throat> I'm, I'm, I'm based in Norway. Um, question is uh, both for the US and abroad or any place, uh, is it a viable option for school districts to adopt and uh, there or abroad, is there competence on the ground for, for them to flourish? Uh, to yes. <laughs> Actually, I love how you I love how you phrased that, because if we could imagine this is where we're really going to reach. But if we could imagine so the public school system, say the public school system is fine. Right. It's the large institutionalized buildings and the way that cuts children off from the community. That really is the problem. So imagine for a second the public school system blown apart and decentralized into these little micro schools. Right. With the teachers decentralized into the community with the students like we talk about liability being an issue or this or that. It's already an issue, you know? I mean, the public schools are not safe. They're not safe schools. So what are we worried about? And as for like competence on the ground is a very good way of putting it. Do we not trust our teachers? We have to trust our teachers. We send our children to them every day. So if we're going to trust our teachers within the classroom, why do we not trust them to be comp like competent right on the ground within a micro school with a, with a selected group of 10 students maybe intentionally diversified for that reason i just think that the teachers put in such a box of the um, mandatory public school teaching within the classroom is is such a tough one because it's insinuating that they need the pressure of administration to do their job teachers go into teaching to teach so they're competent already it's just a trust issue and the the pressure with the larger systems to fit into that industrialized building and make it work that way is it's political pressure, it's administrative pressure, it's businessmen pressure, curriculum developed pressure, right? If we took all of that away and we trusted our competent teachers to decentralize into the community, you would have a bunch of micro schools. They would probably prefer to do it that way, but it's this intrinsic deep seated systematic loyalty to the large systems that has to be broken by understanding that it's a system that, that accomplished some goals, but it's no longer working. So I think in Norway, I think everywhere, every community, everywhere, every neighborhood would, would largely benefit from micro schools with a lot more time for those schools to connect with each other and with the community. I feel very strongly about that. So I, I feel that a, a huge opportunity in these schools, particularly micro schools, especially where you have a lot of these larger institutions having restraints on stuff like ethics and how you know obviously there is spiritual influences and in people's feelings for or against it uh do you include ethics classes in your programs that are baha'i inspired so that's a really good question too and this is where it gets really interesting because i think um anyone thinking down this path also sees the margin for error if schools are decentralized because not only then are they in the hands of of competent, trustworthy teachers, but they're also in the hands of maybe some bad people. So there has to be, I know, a, a sort of metrics or measuring stick for this going forward, but I would, you know, I would assert that even in large public schools, they're in the hands of bad people, you know? So how much more if we decentralize them, maybe we catch it faster um, because parents aren't going to keep their students with a bad teacher. It, it, that's the thing about school choice. If I had the choice to take my student around, I'm not going to keep them with a bad teacher, like with a teacher that wasn't you know, really serving them or wasn't good for them. Um, and that at least the power of choice then would be in the parents' hands. So um, anyway, so with ethics, behind inspired ethics, it doesn't have to be taught. The teachers model it is how I would say. Um, service, because ethics, just like moral character, it's not, it's something you can have in dialogue. You talk about um, emotional appeals, fallacies and things like that, especially around the middle school age is where they get really interested in the red herring and, you know. Um, Fallacies are huge, especially as it relates to media literacy. So media literacy classes are a way, but it's um, it's interesting how with a micro school, you don't, you don't have to block things so much. Like with a class on ethics, it's just infused into everything that's done. It's infused into conversations that you have time to take. Um, integrity is taught through uh, academic integrity because they're working on the computers, they can Google things, <laughs> copy paste, you know, even though there are safeguards set up within the ingenuity system to prevent them from copying and pasting. Um, but with websites like Brainly and Quizlet that are set up for cheating, you know, um, academic integrity is taught through stopping them from using those as word spreads fast about those sites. And then using an Orbi system with a specialized internet blocking 
to enter websites that are then blocked. So it also makes the, the teachers and the admin keep up with the students because the students, they know, you know? So um, the smaller schools, the, the ethics is just infused in how it's run. You can't really hide anything because it's small. So. That's a very, very unique approach. And uh, thank you for taking the time for your presentation to answer these questions. So. Oh, I'm, ha I'm really happy to. And I'm glad the idea of funding and how it applies globally came up because it really does. But I hesitate um, to delve into the funding if people don't specifically have questions about that. Um, sure. But it's very important. So, um, okay. So this is this is the last point on desegregation. I think it's a very important one. So we look at segregation like it effectively mixed the races in America after slavery and civil war, but it didn't. What it did was it integrated um, black students with white adults, black students with white adult teachers. So. It failed to integrate white students and principal black teachers because when the schools were integrated, black students were integrated into the school systems, but the teachers weren't integrated. So now what we have is a bunch of very exposed, vulnerable children who are exposed to implicit bias, which is really becoming increasingly evident within systemic racism. So how do we fix that? And that's something maybe a lot of people hadn't thought about. The integration didn't expose. Um, yeah, it's an interesting one. So. Um, so how does the micro school elevate that? So intentional diversification of staff members, black and white adults, all, you know, races and genders, um, as role models and micro school staff with regular consultation can identify and resolve implicit bias within themselves. So when you have a diverse, um, a intentionally diverse staff, or you're moving towards having an intentionally diverse staff, um, you can help to identify through consultation and friendship, help to identify and resolve implicit bias within yourself. So you're literally modeling this idea of equality as teachers and as adult role models, because that was something that was sorely lacking when the schools integrated, they didn't really integrate, not the teachers. So I think that's an important point to remember um, because that, that idea of integration is integration is one of the reasons people are so strongly and fiercely loyal to a system that really was set up for their children to fail. The, you know, the school to prison pipeline is a reality, right? So as the system is breaking, it's being left in the hands of, of largely black communities who are fighting to preserve the system that they fought to get into. But unfortunately, it's a system that the elite are exiting and creating new systems through private schools and whatnot. And it's left in the hands of the people that it was not created for and that it literally is destroying. So we have to really look at that loyalty and why it's there. Um, so I'm going to bring it back to one of my first slides, which after everything we just looked at with age grading and with um, uh, implicit bias and, and segregation, we're going to look one more time at that quote that was the foundation of service learning school, my school, service learning micro school. Um, so again, service to the world of humanity should be obligatory. You can only do that with a small school. Every student should know with perfect certainty that he is the brother of all people all religions and nations, and that he should be without religious, racial, national, patriotic, or political bias. So that not with, not political love or national love, but bias. It's an important word. You can love your nation for what it is, but there's a way to love and not be biased. So that he may find the thoughts of universal peace and universal love of humankind firmly established in his heart that takes time. So Baha'i inspired school can really only be accomplished in a small group of people, small enough to be efficient in learning through technology and platforms and impactful in application through service and relationships with the students and families. Um, so moving on. So now people usually want to know, so what, how does it, how does the micro school fit this? So one, it's self, it's a self-limiting economic model. You cannot get, you cannot get wealthy, wealthy on a micro school. Because if it's intentionally small, you only have so many students, only brings in so many scholarships. So it actually curtails greed on its own. So um, if people are prevented from having a million micro schools, it can be, um, it can be a self-limiting economic model, but one that creates jobs for parents, employment opportunities, employees, teachers, um, and gives uh, the staff uh, either a profit share at the end or shares within their school so that the staff is really invested, which is also supporting the Baha'i writings, so that the staff is invested in the creation of the school and the running of the school. That's how you, that's how the teachers will want it and the administration. So it is quality over quantity education because it's a micro school. So 
you don't have a ton of kids, you, you provide quality education for the ones you have. Um, it encourages family unity and community relationships through service. Um, and because the teacher can then know the families very well, so they can encourage the family unity. Like, don't talk back to your mom, you know, <laughs> and support the family unit, which that that's just not there in the public schools. There's no reason to do it in public schools, but we know that it's needed in society. So um, it creates excellence in academics by letting kids get ahead with automated curriculum platforms. Um, it gives plenty of time for community involvement projects and traveling because you can take a small school around. <laughs> you can take them on international trips. You can take them around the country. So the it really opens up traveling. And as if you travel as a school, I know classes do small like class projects and whatnot or class trips, but there's something different about doing it as a school. That is unity to its fullest. It's not just a class. It's us against this class or I don't know that kid I just passed in the hallway. It's you guys got through something together as a school. Um, it's easy to relocate. Oh, this is an important one. Time for apprenticeships and early university attendance. So our students do dual enrollment through SPC college. And that's an opportunity that exists to all public school students, all homeschool students, all students have that opportunity, but public schools are so big, they cannot do it. They cannot do it. Because when you have a student in dual enrollment, you are ultimately responsible for that student's success because that transcript, they can't get away from it. That GPA is their GPA. So that you don't play around with that, right? So with a small school, you take your students to meet the dean, they do the placement exam, and they can begin their online university classes. So um, that's something we do. We have three, three students that are three years into it, several, several credits to their college degree. But not all students are college bound. So it also opens up the opportunities for apprenticeship within the community with um, garden, with a, you know, farming and food forest is one amazing opportunity that we have thanks to Comron and the Ridvon Garden and Jay, um, Jay Hardman's in here too. Um, but the apprenticeship opportunities are amazing. Engineering apprenticeship, you know, anything. I had an AP student transfer to our school this year because he realized the AP classes were not going to get him further to his college degree. Um, for engineering, he could do through SBC and Florida State. So dual enrollment was more attractive to him to get there faster. Um, so that's something that we can offer that larger schools just can't stay on top of. Um, and that's that the AP classes were created to accommodate them, but they're not actually getting further ahead. And with automated technology, they're not necessarily getting better educated either. When students are doing SPC classes, they are receiving a college level education, not just AP classes, college level. So, um, but it's easy to relocate the school group when needed, like with COVID or natural disasters. If you have a small school, it's easier to bump location if needed. Um, there's a lot of time for innovation inside and outside the classroom. So. Um, that's a big that's a big point too. So those are again some some benefits to the micro school. So really quick, some current problems, solutions, and then the micro school. So we talked about the achievement gap and reading gap, which I'm very passionate about. But with automated technology for academic learning, with reasonable but challenging achievement goals, um, with uh, that's the solution to it. So with micro schools, teacher observation and automated course progress reports, which happens through technology, prevents learning gaps or at least um, makes them detectable right away. Um, the other issue in society right now is the unsafe schools. Schools are not safe. Either their children are hiding you know, um, around the hall. And I know this just from my experiences in public school, most people can attest to this, but I mean, school shooters aside, we're talking about just the, their general safety or the feeling of safety in schools. Um, smaller schools are safer schools. They just are. So interpersonal relationships, no one falls through the cracks. You build relationships with all of your students and then you don't end up with students who are so angry and ostracized that they want to attack. And if students are threatening to kick each other's butts because someone's dating someone else, you know, the teachers are right there to get involved. I do tend to keep it real. The teachers are right there to get involved and to talk with parents and resolve conflicts. So they're just safer schools. Um, also the clutter that's occurring in the public school system with programs like AP and IEP are just it's just those programs are just an acknowledgement to say that a lot of students are in the middle, but we have to accommodate these other these other sides. How do we do that? So it's becoming cluttered with the programs and systems within the school system. So smaller schools allow for varying levels. No one has to be labeled or specialized because it's already specialized. Advanced students keep moving forward unhindered and everyone has access adequately to teachers um, when questions arise from any student. So people ask a lot, well, what about AP and IEP classes? And those within the system that we use, the technology system coursework, 
there is accommodation for AP and IEP, but really in a small school, it's not even a thing because students just rockets, they, you know, take off like rockets if they're advanced. And if they're not, that opens up the ability for us to be their IEP and assist them, you know, to give them specialized attention. So it kind of takes that whole, that whole clutter out of the school system. Um, also, another current problem is the disconnect between schools and the surrounding communities. So um, how, what's the solution to that? Because there is a disconnect. Schools are, they're walled in, you know, there's a real disconnect between the community and the schools, and it shouldn't be that way. Um, with frequent community involvement is the solution. And with micro schools, schools become a positive example of unity within the community um, because relationships are built. So another current problem is the lack of opportunity outside of the classroom for students. Um, unequal resources and inadequate time, especially with um, varying public school systems with neighborhoods and property taxes. So the solution would be the creation of apprenticeship and early college enrollment systems. So um, in micro schools, that's, it's easy to connect with college programs and apprenticeship opportunities inside and outside the school walls. So it really gets students moving ahead. My biggest thing is the current problem, the youth energy is not being constructively used or maximized. I mean, within the school walls, we have our biggest human resource of energy, right? So youth energy, the solution is youth energy as a human resource for community involvement. You can't do that with a big school because you can't control behavior because behavior wasn't influenced from the young age. So the micro schools, youth channel energy into community building and improvement projects, becoming a bright light and powerful force in the community. Even if you have a micro school with a bunch of unruly teenagers, if it's a small group, you can still do that. You didn't need to catch them from age five and ensure that they were behaving correctly. You can do that with a small group of teenagers. If those teenagers like you and you have a relationship with those teenagers, it, they can be as unruly as they want. They'll behave when you take them out. <laughs> you know, into the community to do things that make them feel good about themselves. So that's beneficial for all ages and it doesn't have to start young. So it sounds great. How do we accomplish this? <laughs> like the action part. Um, so just briefly, um, disclaimer, this is not a political statement. This is kind of what we've touched on so far, but um, how do we accomplish this? There's legislature for school choice programs in many states. It is nonpartisan. But if you see legislature that supports school choice, do that because it opens up these opportunities. Um, these opportunities already exist currently for homeschool, private and charter school options in many states, but a lot of states do not provide the funding necessary for parents to actually make that choice. Like it's nice to say that those choices exist, but there has to be state scholarship funding. So there are a few states where um, the scholarships do adequately provide funding for families and to afford their choice. It's just a matter of getting the choice out there. Um, and those states, as you see, Alabama, Arizona, Arkansas, Florida, Georgia, Indiana, Iowa, Kansas, Louisiana, Mississippi, New Hampshire, North Carolina, Nevada, Ohio, Oklahoma, Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, South Carolina, Utah, Virginia, and Wisconsin are states that um, provide at least 6,000 or more in funds for students. There's some states that provide like 500 or 1,000. It's not going to pay for a private school or charter, you know or what students need for, um, you know, even for homeschooling, it's not gonna allow that opportunity, but these states have at least 6,000 or above, really up to 12,000 per student available in scholarship funding. So that's totally doable if you live in those states, important to know. So say um, that we wanted to, the micro school, schools in the hands of teachers, what would that look like? The really quick steps. So a teacher, um, basically a teacher and families make a commitment. It does require commitment to one another. Um, teachers be, can begin in a rec center or a classroom, any other structure. And this is this is a, would be a whole nother talk as far as um, what the facility would need to provide in order to get the scholarships, but that's a whole nother level. Um, but basically identify a classroom that would be approved. Um, teachers would file as a private school with scholarship compliance. Um, families apply for school, the applicable school, scholar, sc school scholarship. So whether it was for one of the disabilities or the reading gap or the HOPE scholarship, um, the families would apply for that, and that's all done on the web. And then the school is then both funded. Ta -da. <laughs> it's really that easy. I mean, it's, it's hard and challenging, but if you know someone who knows how to do this, it's not that hard. Um, the school is then both funded and in the hands of a trusted teacher. And there it is. And teacher salaries provided for and the, the school costs are provided for and families have a, their, school, their children in a school is both paid for and um, can be trusted. So the teacher will need an administrator to organize it. I must say that. 
<laughs> as the micro school gets a little bit bigger, they will need an administrator to keep to keep it organized because there's a lot of transparency necessary for the states. It's not homeschooling. So, um, so notes. So um, support to school choice legislature, nonpartisan. Freedom in education means that teachers can be in control and parents have the power to choose. And that's what we want. There's a lot of really nice um, method, like ideologies and methodologies of education that are created by, um, you know, extremely intellectual people higher up that don't have kids, kids are not in the system. And it may sound great, like it's going to get us where we're going, but those people should not be in charge of anything school related. They really shouldn't. Teachers are educated. The schools need to be in the hands of the teachers. That is our force on the ground. We don't need business people, politicians, curriculum developers involved in this. The curriculum is all automated now anyway. So we have to trust our teachers. We have to. Um, oh yeah, trust our teachers and parents. <laughs> the time is now. So um, just a few, uh, is, and tell me how we're doing on time too. Are we doing okay on time or? Like yeah, yeah we're doing fine. Uh, the <laughs> questions as we had them, we asked them during your presentation. So we don't really have to say, oh, we had to block off questions at the end because we've been going through asking questions. Okay, great. That's perfect. All right. Yes, we only have a couple more slides, but um, just a, a couple words of caution or pillars of the micro school. So conflicts will arise. The teachers must have a focused direction with the school, but willingness to be flexible. Um, families must ultimately defer to the teacher's decisions and teachers must be aware of family values and not conflict them because that creates dissonance in the students. So that's really important um, that teachers find a way to fit the message or influence they have into the narrative of the family or students go home and they feel at odds with their parents. And that's not okay. So teachers have to honor family unity and family values. Um, families must nurture friendships inside and outside the school. Um, automated technology education has to be used to provide a transparent measurable academic. So it can't just be randomly taught. That transparency has to be there. Um, the school must dedicate itself to community relationships to give the students a purpose um, beyond academic learning. Those are pillars of the micro school in order for it to be effective or it's just a mini version of a public school. Um, which is not what we're trying to do. So uh, it really has to be unrelenting in principles too. Gossip has to be strongly discouraged um, as it drains the energies of teachers and families um, and degrades the system and the group. So micro school teachers must be above average in diplomacy. When you're dealing with a small group, it's hard to get away from things you say. You have to have self-control <laughs> and diplomacy. But it's good for all of us, right? But these are, these are qualities to look for in the micro school teacher. They have to be able to perceive all children as equal. Um, teachers must have a strong sense of detachment because you get very close to your students and families, but you have to have a strong capacity to love. Um, the families must have a willingness to trust the teachers. The decisions cannot be in the hands of the stakeholders. If someone's emotionally involved in decisions for the school, like a parent is, they cannot be in control of the decision making. Teachers have to maintain control um, because families are going to feel very strongly to influence decisions um, based on their love for their child may not be what's good for the group. And back to um, Buckminster Fuller and his idea of the geodesic dome, it's a multi-dimensional decision-making process. So this cannot be accomplished if um, the families have equal say, they have to defer to the teacher. Um, teachers and families work with mindful intentions on diversifying their school so that we don't end up with more socioeconomic or racial gaps. Um, commitment and consultation are key. This is not a smooth process, but that's the point. That's where growth occurs, right? It, seeds don't grow from no soil. You have to push through the dark. Um, so with a small committed group of people though, nothing is impossible. Um, so back to that original quote, because the time is now um, to create something so simple, but so fundamentally different in education that our communities have no choice but to be transformed. Um, we have to trust this process because the opportunity is at our fingertips. And so for more um, photos, I didn't include a lot of photos of our school because I wanted to make this not about my school, um, even though it's the example of it. It is the, the model of it, but um, really wanted to make it more applicable easily to apply to other people through not showcasing my school. Um, but you can see more, more photos of what we've done on our Facebook page and our website. And um, one of our biggest community uh, inspiration involvement pages that really show the power of what micro schools can do um, by digging in their heels is also another community initiative of a big food forest here locally. So I also suggest for inspiration purposes that people check out um, the page for the Ridbon Community Garden. So, yeah. And then thank you everyone for, for listening. <laughs> we 
I know it's a, it's a very, it's a complex and multifaceted and deep. And I talk a lot about it, but, <laughs> but I'm happy to answer questions. There's no question that's not acceptable. I can tell you why I think it has to be a, an organized school versus um, homeschool group. I can, I'll answer questions on basically anything, funding, um, experience, and doesn't matter how controversial, happy to. So there are two questions that are uh, floating around. Uh, first question, and it's a very obvious one. When we talked about just, uh, I think three slides ago, four slides ago, you were talking about involvement of parents with the teachers, the trust of the parents and the teachers. It's without going said that the parents are one of the most important people in this equation. Yes. And um, a lot of schools are uh, expected, they're expected oddly enough to somehow be the source of all the education of these young people growing up. For example, life skills, writing a check, <laughs> lear learning to do basic adulting. Uh, right. Schools are being left with these responsibilities and not the parents who just completely don't do that. Right. Right. It's so true. Yeah. And so schools are really, they're called on to be everything now. Like, and I mean, in the, in the defense of parents, like they're tired and they're busy. And when you have a parent that has several children, it's like, you know, but yeah, the schools and teachers are expected to wear too many hats, but with a micro school, if you want your child to learn how to write a check, Hey, guess what? I got three minutes before class starts, you know, and I, I don't have a big admin breathing down my neck you know, and, uh, you know, these state standards to, to adhere to and report on because everything's automated in ingenuity anyway, you know, I can take three minutes and teach your kid how to write a check. I can also take them to Enterprise Village in financial finance park <laughs> in Tampa, mind. which we do. You've read school, my mind. Right. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's a small school. So we have time. Like, can you imagine public school teachers fitting those curriculums into their school day? Not only do they Not have at to- all. Right. But we did it. We loved it. You know, it became our a big part of our, our preparation phase because we have a small school and then we put them in a minivan in the Yukon and took our class there. Like, so you can do, you can actually do much more with a smaller school and they're still meeting all the academic milestones of public school and exceeding it and doing college enrollment because the group is small. So, but there are some things that parents will ask for, um, like structured sports and things like that, where you have to tell them, I, that's not what we do. You have to pursue that outside of, and by the way, they don't have homework because we have plenty of time for their academics in class. They don't have homework unless they fall behind on the percent goal, but they have time after school to pursue sports. Athletes love this model because they have time to practice and they have time for, for games and the families have time to have dinner <laughs> after school. So again, it's like the, the issues that are occurring in public schools and the pressure that teachers are under is just because it's this large industrialized system and everything else is falling through the cracks. And we're trying, trying to fight to preserve it and, and fight to improve it, but it's not, it's six decades later, it's not working. But you can't, yeah, the, you do have to be careful as a teacher to not, I don't want to say jump through the hoops of parents, but you can't accommodate every whim because there's some things parents want for their child that are not necessary for the group. But that's the teacher's job, right? Is to know what's good for the group and to, to take and redirect suggestions as they come. If it's a need that can be met reasonably, great. If it's a need that cannot be met reasonably and should be met by a parent, then you should have the enough relationship with the parent to communicate to them that without it being a problem, right? Because the relationship is there. Yeah, yeah. And the, the reason for bringing that up was really on the end of, you know, not just the schools having to pick up the slack, but it seems to me that parents have a larger role in this process with a micro school. Oh, much more so. Yeah. And volunteering and being involved. Yeah. It, it kind of forces them if they didn't think of it before, which they should have, in my opinion, it forces them to recognize the reality that they're a part of the process more so than just dumping their children somewhere else. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And for parents that, for single working moms that, you know, have several kids um, or for veteran families where their, you know, dads in the army, um, it's, I, for those families, I, I don't want them to need to be more involved. And I guess that that's the thing with the homework and with outside 
the outside schooling that happens in large public schools is I want to be able to meet what reasonably and balanced a school can meet and should meet during the day. So that when you have a single, a single working mom um, and uh, you know, a single mom basically because dad's off fighting, fighting for our freedom, I want those moms to not have to do anything more. Just trust that I, I did it, you know, and enjoy your child when they get home. I want that too, because there's some that just, you know, it's exhausting. So, yeah, but that's balance versus balance. everything else. <laughs> and balance. That's why I chose the Kiwi as the logo. It's all about balance, but you can do that with a small school. So, so there is one last question, and then we plan to wrap up. So, this is a pretty basic question. Carl Stefan, uh, after I asked if he'd want to uh, tell you it himself, but, uh, he, he felt because of the circumstances that it might not be applicable, but I think it is. So he's asking about um, a micro school in a place that isn't as, um, as materials rich. So mm -hmm. they don't have the resources, not as resource rich. For example, in a state in this country that doesn't provide funding, hypothetically, and you're right. working with a smaller budget. Yes. Um, he was asking if, and where there are some resources for technology deficient environments? Mm, that's a good question. Well, this is a challenge in states that don't have funding, state scholarships, which is why I don't get political. It's not political, but I, I, do, I do get involved with a supporting legislator for school choice so that parents have this opportunity and it is funded. It's important that it be funded. Um, you have to have sustainable funding or you may as well just, you know, if you can homeschool, you can homeschool, but a lot of people don't have the money to do that. Um, so this has to be funded. So in a, in a environment that is not as technology rich, we tend to think that funding depends on like neighborhood and resources, but it actually doesn't. It's separate, it's there anyway. It's just that neighborhoods that are shorter in resources don't know how to take advantage of that. And that's why we need people to get in there and tell them that it's there. Um, so, this could easily be done though in a rec center. I started in a rec center classroom. I didn't start with a business plan. I didn't start with money. I started trying to do this fundraising, working a second job. I was working a second job online teaching adults, mm -hmm. started this in a classroom, in a rec center, or in, a, in actually a friend's guest house. <laughs> it was six kids whose, whose parents volunteered them for this, for me to try to do a school based on service. And it worked and it, it kept, you know, gaining ground. But so I switched to, okay, renting a rec center for $500 a month, which actually one of the parents of one of my students paid for because they so believed in what we were doing. $500 a month, I couldn't afford it because we weren't making any money because I didn't have scholarships. I didn't know how to do that. So from there, it went to renting a rec center the following year, also trying to do this in house, got kicked out, you know, so it, there's always a way to do this, even when the resources aren't plentiful. Um, this is possible in all communities. And if it requires um, fundraising, that's fine too. That's how I tried to do this. I self-funded it and then I tried to fundraise. I'm not good at fundraising. I'd rather just focus on the students. So I need a guaranteed funding. So I didn't have to think about that. Um, so that's possible. But if someone's effective at fundraising, this grants could be raised to support this. Um, so there's the thing about the micro schools is there's always a way to do it. We use Chromebooks. They're like, $150, $200 on Amazon. And we just log into Ingenuity on the Chromebook. So it doesn't require, it, that's the beauty of this. It doesn't require a huge startup cost. It just requires finding a location that will be approved for scholarships, a dedicated teacher and like 10 students. That's how it starts. That is amazing. And if mm -hmm. people watching this, uh, they've watched your practically your how-to guide of the beginnings of just starting to say, all right, I can do it. And, and someone wants to start a micro school. I think this is a very, very good explanation for that. So it, it um, where people didn't feel that they could, they hopefully will be now empowered that they can. Mm -hmm. So thank you for your beautiful talk on this subject. Something that is so sorely needed where education quality is, uh, and always will be paramount. <laughs> <laughs> the future. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank you, too. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, John, for this opportunity. And um, again, for those watching, uh, this is through clearwaterbahais.org. You can view this on YouTube right now. It is 
actually streaming live on YouTube and it's going to be viewable on our YouTube channel, Clearwater Baha'is. And also it's on Facebook under the Baha'i Center of Clearwater. So for anyone who wants to share this, if Jamie, you know, you, you can see it on Facebook now, just give it a share, uh, whoever wants to see it as well. So you don't have to give this talk a hundred times. <laughs> <laughs> I would though. <laughs> hey, hey, that because you do, it means you love it. <laughs> <laughs> but nonetheless, you know, like if, if people can't make it and you're yeah. in another part of the world or you're in another part of the country, you didn't know Jamie yet. Now mm -hmm. you have a place to ask your questions. We'll be passing questions to Jamie as soon as we get them. All right. Bye, everybody.